Hi everyone. Um, in chapter four, we are going to be looking at market failures and the consequences of market failures. Uh, so we're going to begin by looking at demand side market failures, then the supply side market failures, and the inefficiencies caused by these failures. Then we're going to describe and show consumer and producer surplus. We're going to define what a private good is and a public good. And that's where we're going to wrap up today's discussion. On Thursday, we're going to continue with our discussion about public goods, what's called the free rider problem and quasi public goods, and then show you how to find the optimal, optimal amount of public goods the government should produce using what we call a cost benefit approach. And then finally, We'll finish with a dis little discussion about government failure. Okay, so our focus today is on the first part I was just talking about. So let's get into it. Okay, so let's start talking about market failures. The how and the why. So Remember, we talked about efficient markets where we find an equilibrium price, the perfect quantity supplied is found, and the perfect demand is found at a agreeable price to both supplier and consumer. Well, market failure occurs when the competitive market system fails to produce the correct amount of goods. So overproduction or underproduction occurs or no production at all. So resources then would be considered overallocated or underallocated depending on which way the market fails. So we're going to take this time to talk more about that. Like what causes these failures and, and why does overallocation and underallocation occur? So let's start with the demand side. Now, demand side market failures occur because it may be impossible to charge all consumers for a product. Some may be able to enjoy benefits without actually paying for a product. And the example given in the book, which is a very good example, would be a fireworks display. You know, there's no way to prevent people who didn't pay to see fireworks from watching them. And because of that, firms may not be willing to produce the fireworks since they cannot cover the costs. Supply side. A supply side market failure occurs when a firm does not pay the full cost of producing what it's making, its output. And a great example of that, and it was provided in the book as well, as well, is pollution costs. If a firm doesn't take into account all of the cost of producing a product, even the pollution costs, it will result in a supply side market failure because all of the costs are not reflected in supply. So the firm could produce more electricity and pollution than the firm would produce if they paid the pollution they emitted. So now you have supply side failure because they believe their costs are lower. In an efficiently functioning market, two things must happen. The demand curve must reflect the consumer's full willingness to pay for an item. On the supply side, the supply curve must reflect all the costs of production in order for it to be truly an efficiently functioning market. So there's no one getting anything for free and all the costs, even pollution costs, would be accounted for when creating that supply curve. It's in this type of market, we say we maximize surpluses to consumers and producers. So we're going to take a look at that graphically to really show you what does that mean. What is consumer surplus? Well, consumer surplus is 
the difference between what a consumer is willing to pay for a good and what the consumer actually pays because they get an extra benefit from paying less than what the maximum price would be that they are willing to pay. So let's say you go into a car dealership and you're willing to pay $25,000 for a car, but you only have to pay 22,000. Well, you have a $3,000 surplus, the difference between what you're willing to pay and what you actually pay. Here's a nice table demonstrating this. So we have five, six different people. There's the amount, the maximum amount each is willing to pay. Bob's 13, Barb's 12, Bill's 11, the maximum amount. The equilibrium price right now is $8. So you're willing to pay 13, but you pay eight. So you have a consumer surplus. Graphically, here's what that looks like. Here is your demand curve. You could see, if, or um, it's, you know, um, coming sloping down. It's starting at a quantity of zero and the maximum amount a person is willing to pay, whatever that amount could be. For Bob, it could be 15. Eight is the equilibrium. Okay, so any price less than 15 will create, or whatever that maximum amount is, surplus for you as a consumer because you have that extra money in your pocket. So if you pay equilibrium, every price above that is considered a surplus represented by the green triangle. So the yellow um, square represents the amount that they are going to pay and then the triangle represents the surplus, the consumer surplus. So that is consumer surplus. Producer surplus occurs what be, um, and is measured by the difference between the actual pr price a producer receives and the minimum price they are willing to accept. So any price they receive above the minimum price is considered a surplus. So if this was the producer, the minimum price each is willing to accept is listed there. The equilibrium price, what it's actually selling at is listed there. So each producer would incur a surplus except for Chad. His would be right at zero. Graphically, the producer surplus, and remember our supply curve goes the other way. And at quantity of zero, price would be zero, okay? But for each price, the producer, minimum price, the producer is willing to accept and um, sell the product at, produce that product at, up to equilibrium, that represents producer surplus. So once again, when producers receive a greater price than their marginal cost, the minimum acceptable amount, remember that has to be cost, producer surplus is created. So again, let's go back to the car. So now you're the seller of a car. You probably have the, an idea, what's the lowest possible price that I'll take? If you receive a price that is higher than this lowest possible price, then you received a producer surplus. So again, the blue triangle is the difference between the actual price received and the minimum amount or marginal cost of the product. So for quantity Q1, down across the bottom, a producer receives the sum of the amounts of the blue triangle plus the yellow because they only need to receive the amount shown by the yellow to produce Q1. The blue triangle represents producer surplus. Now in an efficient market, when the market achieves efficiency, 
as we see here. The maximum combined consumer and producer surplus is achieved. So at quantity Q1, and where the equilibrium price is eight, the consumer surplus in the green triangle and the producer surplus in the blue triangle is maximized. Efficiency occurs. The right amount is being produced. The everybody's surplus is at the maximum. There's no over or under allocation of resources. So productive efficiency is achieved because the forces, the competitive forces, um, forces force and um, actually producers are forced to use the best available technology and combination of resources available. So you don't have over allocation or under allocation. So the key is consumer surplus has to be at the efficient amount, which is willingness to pay. Okay, the comparison of willingness to pay to equilibrium and everybody is paying what they are willing to pay. Producer efficiency is that the producer is receiving the minimum price to produce that product. Their surplus is caused when they receive more. So allocative efficiency is achieved because the correct quantity of product is produced relative to other goods and services. Okay, so that's producer surplus, consumer surplus, and when we're working in an efficient market, they're both maximized. But what happens when there's efficiency loss? What exactly are we talking about here? Well, here this demonstrates efficiency loss when we have underproduction. So we call these dead weight losses. This is when the reduction, there are reductions of combined consumer surplus and producer surplus. Why? Because quantity levels that are either less than or greater to the efficient quantity are being produced. So if the quantity being produced is at Q2, there's an underproduction. Producers are producing where the price is less. So they're producing less because their surplus is less. It'll cause their surplus to, to be less. And consumers are being charged more. So this also affects their surplus. So they won't buy as much, or I'm sorry, they, they, there's not as much available to buy, so their um, costs are higher. So in um, overproduction, where the, um, for, the uh, supplier is producing at quantity three, they're expecting to sell for more than $8, but at Q3, the demand is only at a less at amount less than the equilibrium amount, say it's eight dollars. So that means there'll be an overproduction. Less will be bought um, and demanded because the supplier is expecting a higher amount, charging a higher amount for the product. So that's where we have overproduction or an overallocation of resources. It also demonstrates that the surplus is less for both consumer and producer when this occurs. So those are the problems with uh, market failures. The um, consumer, the one demanding the product, must be paying the amount or everybody must be willing to pay and be charged what they're willing to pay. And um, 
consumer, or I'm sorry, producers must account for all costs, including those hidden costs like pollution when creating their supply. If that happens, then we'll have an efficient market where the equilibrium price will not cause overproduction or underproduction of a good consumer surplus and producer surplus will be at its maximum amount. Okay, so those few slides we just went through demonstrated why the market fails and what results with the over allocation and under allocation of um, goods and our efficiency is then of course affected. So three things to remember to, to achieve allocative efficiency where our resources are being um, used properly. The marginal benefit of an item has to equal marginal costs and that just means supply and demand are at equilibrium. Maximum willingness to pay also equals minimum acceptable price and combined consumer and producer surplus is at a maximum. So when you have those three characteristics or events in place, allocative efficiency occurs and the proper quantity is being produced and demanded. Okay, now private goods. We've been focusing on those for the most part. Private goods, of course, are produced and sold in competitive markets. And they have two major characteristics. First of all, they're offered for sale. But here's their characteristics. They have rivalry and excludability. And this is important for, give me one second, get some of my notes here. Um, for a private good. So what do we mean by rivalry and excludability? Well, first of all, rivalry means that if one consumer buys the good, another one can't. So there's a race to get the product. It's not out there for everyone to use. And excludability means that those are who are unable and unwilling to pay don't have access to the benefits of the product. It's because of these characteristics, private goods are competitive. And private firms will produce and sell the goods for a profit because people who are able to purchase them will and people who can't won't. They won't get it for free. On the other side are public goods. And Although we don't want to think of the words public goods as government provided goods, it just ends up being that public goods are often forced to be provided by the government because they're offered for free. They, they're non-rivalry. There's non-excludability. And we have this thing called a free rider problem. So let's, let's talk about this some more. The demand curve of public goods may underreport how much consumers are willing and able to pay. Why? Because if they can get them for free, it's just like the fireworks display. How much are you willing to pay? Well, if somebody else can sit there and do get them for free, well, you are, you're probably willing to pay less. So public or social goods would not be produced through the market because they have these characteristics. There's no non-rivalry, meaning that when one consumers, one consumes the good, it doesn't preclude another from consuming the good, like the fireworks display. Whether you pay for it or not, you could still sit there and enjoy, have the same benefit from it. Non-excludability means that no one can be prevented from enjoying the benefits of a public good. So you don't have to pay for it. And it doesn't, if you don't pay for it, you can't stop somebody else from not using the good and anyone can enjoy it. 
So with non-rivalry and non-excludability, public goods suffer from this free rider program. And I experienced this while I was in New Orleans. I saw it and they talk a little bit about it in your book. So what is the free rider problem? It means that many people can benefit from the goods without paying it, making it unprofitable for firms to produce these goods since they have no way to ensure that only paying consumers will enjoy the goods. So examples, everywhere you go in New Orleans, there's a street performer. There's some really good ones and there's some really not so good ones. And they're on every corner. Do people pay these street performers on every corner for the service they're providing? Probably not. So there's many people that just because of where the street performer is located will in, be able to hear the music, watch the magic act, watch them be in a statue, okay? So there's non-rivalry. We're not fighting because of how much money we paid. It's a non-excludable service because whether you, uh, you know, you enjoy it no matter what, you don't have to pay for it. You can pay for it, but you can enjoy it this, just the same without paying for it, okay? So this is really considered a public type of good. So free riders are those who enjoy all of that without paying. So it's usually the government who needs to provide these types of goods because a private industry won't produce it because it doesn't force the price into equilibrium. People are not really, it's the demand is not truly demonstrating the willingness to pay. Um, so the government will produce and um, produce things and offer things like national defense, maybe public music concerts, outdoor firework displays. These are some just some examples of public goods. So on Thursday, when we meet, I just wanted to get through this first part of chapter um, four and talk about the inefficiencies. I know I started saying on Thursday, but on Thursday, we will conclude chapter four. But just to review, let's take a few minutes here and go back through what we talked about. We are focusing on market failures and what causes these market failures and how do we determine market failures. And as I get my notes together here, just give me a second. We first talked about market failure occurs when we don't produce the right amount of goods, whether it's overproduction or underproduction. So far we focused on efficient markets where the proper quantity is being produced, allowing for proper out um, resource allocation and providing what people want. But because at times it's impossible to charge people what they're willing to pay, like the fireworks, a demand side market failure can occur. Supply side is when the supplier doesn't account for all the costs of production. In an de efficient market, demand does reflect what a consumer is willing to pay and supply reflects all the costs of production. And it will maximize consumer surplus, which is the difference between the maximum they could pay in equilibrium and consumer, or, um, I'm sorry, the producer surplus, which is the, what they're going to receive, what they're receiving minus their marginal cost, which is the minimum they're willing to sell it for. What happens with overproduction and underproduction, as we saw, is that we encounter efficiency losses. So if not enough of a quantity of goods is being produced, so it's below the equilibrium quantity, we find that we have an underproduction problem. Um, people are demanding more, suppliers are supplying less because of the amount that they can charge in a market where there's overproduction, there's too much of a product being produced, 
suppliers are demanding a higher price than what consumers are willing to pay for it. When overproduction or underproduction occurs and inefficiency results, that's when we have a, um, a problem with our consumer surplus and producer surplus. They're less than maximum. We finally wrapped up talking about the private goods and public goods. So like I said, on Thursday, we're going to focus more now on the government's intervention. Public goods, talk about public goods that the government does produce, how they determine the right amount to produce, okay, and what we call externalities. Okay, so thank you for listening. And um, if you have any questions, let me know. But if not, then continue with all the work that you're supposed to have done. I believe you should be getting done with the Learn Smart activity. And then I'll see us on Thursday, hopefully, in the classroom so that we can finish up this chapter. See us then.